get in there. Um, and say, oh, it looks like the numbers are leveling out a bit now. We've got about 150 people in so far. So it's looking good. Um, right, so for those of you that don't know us already, my name's Alex Blake. I'm the director at Keda Consulting. Um, we're a fundraising consultancy. Um, we work mainly on helping charities to secure grants um, and to improve their trust fundraising programs. Um, so naturally, we're, we're always interested in what grant makers are doing, um, where practices might be changing, um, what, what they're kind of thinking and thinking about and discussing and, and the plans they're making. Um, and kind of using those insights to think about how charities can then um, do better in terms of securing the funding they need and also developing positive relationships with funders um, and how we can all work together to um, to achieve more social impact and social change, which is, of course, what, what we're all ultimately interested in and why, why we're involved in this sort of work. Um, so... Um, just a couple of plugs from me. Um, seeing as you get to come to a free event, I'll get to plug some of the stuff we're doing. Um, so if you're interested in improving your trust fundraising program, um, we've recently launched a scorecard online, which is a free and confidential online tool um, where you answer a bunch of questions, only takes less than 10 minutes, um, and then it will calculate a score for you across five categories. Um, and give you some some recommendations on how you can improve in some of those areas. Um, so that's totally free. Um, and then we're also delivering some training around trust fundraising um, starting around the end of October and running. Um, we'll be using Zoom and doing like five modules, one each week for five weeks um, and providing some resources and support around that as well. Um, so if you're interested in either of those things, um, you can find that pretty easily on our website. Um, we've got an early bird rate on the training um, this week. So um, that ends end of Friday. Um, so get booked up if you're interested in that and you want to get the cheaper rate. Um, but that's enough of plugging our stuff and talking about us. Um, so today, as you know, uh, we're looking at changes in grant making. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, there have been certainly some kind of different ways of working um, for funders um, following COVID, um, certainly looking at all the kind of emergency funding programs that were launched um, and also the way that funders worked with their existing grantees. Um, and, and really, I suppose, looking at um, some of those kind of pledges that were made in that London funders statement that I'm sure most people will have seen um, and about 400 funders ended up signing up to that um, and really you know it is more flexibility um, and, and providing support and, and being um, very responsive to, to the needs of grantees um, and looking at the emergency funding you know lots more unrestricted funding than usual much quicker decision making time scales um, kind of simpler forms to fill in um, and so you know all, all of that kind of points towards more kind of trust in relationships you know kind of you know trust in that that they're supporting good organizations and don't need you know so much kind of detail in terms of the, the reporting and that side of things as well um, so it'd be interesting to see if some of those things actually stick around um, if some of those changes are here to stay or if, if some of it's just going to kind of go more back to business as usual. Um, and before, before COVID took over our lives, um, there were already a whole bunch of kind of big conversations happening in the grant making sector. Um, so certainly a lot of the bigger foundations looking at um, big issues around um, inclusion and diversity, climate change, ethical investment, collaboration, um, the way they look at measuring impact and, and learning and evaluation. Um, so, so some really interesting kind of ongoing conversations and trends there as well. Um, so today um, we've got three speakers who are going to be sharing their insights, um, certainly on some of the kind of changes that we've seen uh, in response to COVID and that kind of very, very recent work, um, but probably also touching on some of those other kind of big big issues that are happening for um, grant makers and, and how they're kind of looking at their practice at the moment. 
Um, so we're going to start off with Ben Cairns from um, Institute of Voluntary Action Research, um, who work with um, both charities that provide services and also um, grant making charities um, and produce great research reports um, looking at some of those kind of issues around those relationships between funders and their grantees. Um, so Ben's got some really interesting insights from that work um, and the work they've been doing with charity leaders since COVID hit. Um, Ben's got to leave early unfortunately so what we're going to do is um, we'll get Ben to answer any questions you've got specifically from his talk immediately afterwards. Um, so in a minute Ben will talk 10-15 um, minutes um, if you've got any questions for him if you just pop them in the chat function um, then we'll, Ben can cover off some of those immediately afterwards. Um, and then we've got Emma Beeston who's a philanthropy advisor who works with various foundations and philanthropists um, and so has an interesting insight across kind of a range, speaking to a range of funders um, and, and looking at what's going on in kind of grant making and philanthropy. Um, so Emma will be able to share some insights with us as well from those kind of current conversations. Um, and then we've got um, Kirsten Brown from Goldsmiths Company, um, so who has that kind of experience directly working within a grant maker and how they've um, responded um, to the in, in terms of delivering emergency funding and so on, um, but is also a co co-founder of the Grant Givers Movement. Um, so again, has that kind of broader view of some of these kind of big conversations that are happening um, amongst grant makers at the moment. Um, and then afterwards, then we'll have um, time as usual at the end for kind of Q and A. Um, so Emma and Kirsten can can answer more questions at the end. Um, so we've got we've got a lot of people with us today. So if you have got questions, try and get them in the chat box as early on. You know, just as they come to you, pop them in the chat box there, um, and then they're more likely to get covered off. Um, final thing to say: we're recording the session, um, so we'll be uh, we'll be sharing the recording with you all in the follow up email um, either today or tomorrow, um, and then also if any of the speakers are sharing, um, referencing any kind of research reports or articles or videos online or anything like that, um, we'll pop some links in the follow-up email as well so you can access that stuff afterwards. Um, I think that's everything. Um, if I've forgotten any useful or important housekeeping stuff, Amy will probably pop it in the chat function as well for us. Um, so I think, um, I think we can just get started now. Um, so I'll hand over to Ben, um, and I realise I'm doing the slides for you as well, aren't I? So um, Ben, if you want to kind of take over and start introducing yourself, um, and I will get hold of your slides and get those open. Great. Um, it's really nice to be here and to see about 24 of you. I'm sorry, I can't see the rest of you. I'll have to imagine what you look like. Um, and apologies I've got to go in fact I'm going to facilitate a session of Trust and Foundation learning staff so uh, where we're, we're banging the drum for the importance of learning at the moment and not um, pinging back to pre-COVID business as usual but trying to build on the momentum that's just been gathered. Apologize too I've got to are terrorizing me at the moment in non shed. So they made their land heavily occasionally. So that's what's going on there. I did think in Alex's introduction, thank you uh, for your words and, and definite plug for the work that Kiba is doing. Uh, I really would encourage people to follow up on that. And this is an amazing facility that you've provided here, Alex. Uh, and also a plug for the work that Kirsten's been doing in the um, in the publications there. That is a a fantastic probably long overdue <laughs> initiative but also quite a bold one so we really support that uh, very much. I was thinking that we, I have got a presentation but I was thinking in the introduction that really you know how come it took a pandemic to for funders to wake up to some of the uh, the things that matter most to uh, helping good work be good and helping it happen. We were running a session yesterday as part of the ongoing work we're doing with the leaders of small 
to media and voluntary community organisations. And we asked people at the end what their messages were for funders. And, uh, and, and somebody said, um, uh, trust us. Uh, we know what to do and we do it well. And I thought uh, that was a very simple message. And this is really uh, what lies at the heart of what I want to talk about today is that uh, our view, and this is formed out of 20 years of work in this field, but more recently quite intensive work since um, uh, the national lockdown in March, that progressive funding is simple. Actually, you know, what have we learned in the last six months? Uh, as Alex has said, we've learned that it's possible to do things quickly, that there's been a premium on unrestricted funding, light touch process, light touch reporting. And that brings the best out in people. Because if we, if we talk to charity leaders, and I know this right back at the start of my career in the voluntary sector in 1987, setting up a, a day centre for homeless families in West London. That's one of the kind of, you know, if you ask people what is difficult about leading a small organisation, in the top three, it will always be funding or funding relationship. The anxiety about applying, the stress of waiting, the uncertainty of whether you're going to receive it or not, and then the stress of accounting for the money, the stress of reapplying, etc. And I always think, even at IVAR, when we're renegotiating core funding, and I'm being asked to jump through hoop after hoop, and I think, you know, you are, I am spending your money asking you for more money. That, that can't be a good thing. Is that bringing the best out of me and my organization? So I think um, jumping ahead, really, I think there is a real opportunity here um, to to really shift the dial quite radically. And for me, you know, 32, three years in the sector, this really does feel like a once in a lifetime opportunity. We did some work that some of you may have read after the uh, Manchester Arena bomb, the Grenfell Tower fire and the attacks on London Bridge in, uh, in uh, 2017, published as the possible, not the perfect. And what we saw in the aftermath of those emergencies, and I think this is the kind of, along with the recession, those are the analogous moments to what we've been seeing the last six months. What we saw is that some funders were able to, what we call step outside the normal. They were able to suspend normal practice and introduce a much lighter approach to due diligence, a different uh, attitude to risk, a higher premium on trust. And hey presto, the sky didn't fall in. The Tudor Trust administered one million pounds worth of funds to organizations working in and around Grenfell Tower. And they did that uh, by setting up uh, in the Westway Community Center, inviting groups to come in. And they filled out uh, a side of A4 with the group when they were there. And then they, then they went back to the Tudor Trust that evening with grant staff seconded from other foundations, made decisions then, money in the account the next morning. Now, sure, uh, foundations may say, and Kirsten may want to pick this up, but that it would be difficult to apply that model to all spend. And I don't think we're, anyone's arguing that uh, differentiated approaches may not be important and appropriate depending on uh, the nature of the work being funded depending on the kind of the nature of the relationship you may have with who is being funded. But nonetheless, it was possible to get money out quickly. Good work happened, the sky didn't fall in. And we've seen that, haven't we, in the last six months. It has been possible to step outside the normal. And many of you will have experienced that. And many of you will have experienced that from the position of unprecedented stress uh, and anxiety. When I look at the list of things that we hear from charity leaders at the moment about what has been difficult about the last six months, about the stress on you as leaders, about the stress on your workforce, about the anxiety about people who use your services and whether they're able to access them digitally because it's not possible to meet them face to face, about the stress of what it means to try and plan and think about the future. When you know, as is evidenced by this morning, 
we are now entering you know, another period of unpredictability and uncertainty. And that, I think, as far as the eye can see, describes uh, the future for us all. The difference, I think, for all of us is the dial's been turned up on all of those stresses at the same time. Because many of these things are familiar to people running organisations, aren't they? But the sense of burnout as leaders, the worrying about staff, volunteers, buildings, funding, future, boards, all of that. But they're all happening at the same time. And I think it is notable that funders have responded. They have listened and they have been flexible. They provided continuation funding, they provided short-term funding, they've lightened up on process. But you know, that can't carry on. We cannot be on a hamster wheel of six month cycles because that is stressful. It creates uh, already, the moment you get an emergency grant, of course, and this is the awful reality of, of, of funding and fundraising, you're already worrying about where the next one's coming from. So we need to think about how can we bring a bit of uh, a bit of certainty, a bit of confidence uh, to that future. By the way, I have no idea. Are you sharing slides or not? Because um, no. Okay. So the slide deck uh, will be. I was suddenly thinking. Does someone notice I'm jumping from slide six to slide two? Uh, sorry, I um, didn't realise I was. Uh, only I know um, that's happening. Yeah. We'll share them later. I, um, so. Let me, uh, if that you want me to jump no, 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 don't worry, let's just carry on like, carry on like this. I want to um, bring a bit of um, uh, structure for the last uh, few minutes, but it would be, be more interesting if we can move to questions, I think, for me. I want to first of all, and I think we'll do three or four things before we go into the, the theme, because a lot of this is in the, in the slide deck and uh, a lot of this is um, available in the links that we're going to send round to, sorry, I'm seeing some, can, okay, there's a lot of chat about whether people can hear me or not. I think most of you can. A lot of this is also in the links uh, to previous research that we've done around core funding uh, and around reporting and, and around risk. So what were the five things that characterised the responses in 2017 that we've seen mirrored in the last six months? Commitment to speed, managing risk through relationships rather than paper and systems, collaborative delivery and delegated decision-making, something that Kirsten might want to pick up on in terms of that grant staff being given more autonomy there. Light touch application and monitoring, any of us have been in the sector for any period of time that is something that we've been arguing for since the year dot and flexible funding and three quotes stand out for me from the earlier work that really have resonated with us and i think we've tried to think about and work with funders uh, to try and absorb and these are all from uh grenfell it's a different thought process are they competent? Are they telling me the truth? Are they able to deliver this? And if the answer is yes, 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 on the basis of a face-to-face -face interaction, then you can make a decision. Secondly, and this is poignant, I think, because this is in 2017, every day in a community is an emergency. You don't have to have a tragedy to give money that way. And at the time, we were struck when we were doing that research, by some contributions made by colleagues who work in the uh, in, in domestic violence, the field of domestic violence, where people were continuing to suffer, people were continuing to die day to day, week to week, and yet the same level of urgency was not being brought to that issue. And we can think about other social issues that that we work with. So you don't have to have a tragedy to give money that way. And thirdly, and I think this is the, is the key one if we think about the future of grant making practice. A quote from the foundation involved in the emergency funding. We can understand effectiveness in this context as meaning straightforward, easy, quick and trusting. 
And actually, Alex referred to the London Funders Pledge, and we see some of the spirit of that idea of effectiveness translated into that pledge. And we know from, I'm sure all of you, but from the work that we've been doing supporting charity leaders since March, that there has been enormous appreciation by the flexibility shown by most funders. Unrestricted income, as we've said, look easier reporting, and the reassurance that it's okay to change tack. But we know that there is a disproportionate reliance on trust and foundations in some fields, in some geographies, in some subsectors to weather this crisis and adjust to whatever is needed for the future. And one of the questions I think we need to ask and that needs to be, begin to be hardwired into how funders themselves now think about the future is what is it reasonable to respect of a voluntary and community organization in relation to its future plans. The session I was running yesterday included a number of small organizations who run community centers that have a mixture of tenants, small community groups, and also they provide some services themselves, most of which have gone online. And I was struck by the description of one of the leaders there. And she said, what we can be certain about as we look forward down the foggy runway into the future. What we can be confident about is we can be confident about our mission, what we stand for, why we're here. And we can be confident about the needs that we are here to meet. That is the spine of our strategy. But what we can't be certain about is how many activities we can deliver and how we can deliver them. So the volume of activity and the method of activity is subject to variables outside of our control, as witnessed by the announcements today, which of course are all going to have a bearing on how we think about the return to work and the return to delivery of services. Now that is the reality for voluntary and community and social enterprise organizations. And we need to see that reality reflected in how funders themselves are thinking about the future and what they require of and accept from organizations in terms of their plans. The, the foreseeable future is characterized by uncertainty and unpredictability. And in a way that needs to be reflected, I think, in funding. So if I can just um, finish uh, off, what are we trying to do about how to sustain and support sustaining progressive practice? Because what we see is the need for unrestricted funding, the need for light touch process, the need for realistic proportionate expectations, engagement with bigger questions, that have been thrown up about this, the role of civil society in, in advocacy and social change, the, the significant challenges that are now faced around diversity, equality, inclusion, and power. The risk that if you move to too much trust, you actually rule out organizations you haven't yet heard from. Um, we hear a lot about uh, access, for example, to trust and foundations from smaller Bain groups. And the historical narrative has been that, well, they are not set up to be funded in the way that we need to fund. But actually, if you genuinely want reach to accomplish your mission, then your system, your eligibility criteria, your, your process need to be constructed in a way that maximizes the potential for such groups to receive uh, funding. So that needs to be flipped around. So what we're trying to do through an IVAR-led learning review in collaboration with a small group of, of funders and a, and, a, and a parallel group of charities is to think about how we can sustain this progressive practice into the future. What does it mean for these adaptations and innovations that have been so welcome over the last six months to become the new normal? And on our website, uh, you can read about, uh, about that learning review. 
But what we're arguing is that the future, insofar as any of us can, can predict what it's going to look like, is going to require a sustained commitment to flexibility and adaptation. And that, that the power to change that rests with funders. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm not sure if we've had any questions, folks. It's mostly been chat about some people losing the sound, uh, and we we seem to have fixed it by unlocking the meetings. People can leave and rejoin. Seems to have sorted it out for most people. Um, if people have lost sound for a bit and missed some, um, when the recording comes through, um, you'll be able to catch up because um, the sound's fine at this end. Um, okay, there's a question just appeared here, Ben. Um, very interesting really ways of working with Grenfell community and recent ways of working. Um, one challenge for organisations is lack of core costs and the time resource it takes to set up partnerships and collaboration. Any thoughts? Well, um, <laughs> I don't know if I've got a thought. I mean, I've got a feeling <laughs> about that. Um, I think if I if I if we go back to the um, the point that I was sharing from the session I was on yesterday about what does a strategy and what does a plan look like. I think you know one of our mantras at Ivar has been for the last 20 years, you know, form follows function. So if we think about an organization who is able to describe their mission, describe what they stand for, describe their needs they're trying to meet, describe how they're going to try and meet those needs, but actually but has on that there is uncertainty around that. If the exam question was then what kind of funding is most likely going to be able to bring that enable that organization to be the best organization it can be an organization that can be true to that mission tr strive to meet those needs but be flexible about how you do it the answer would have to be unrestricted funding you would never go down a project funding route for that because the project funding i'm afraid suffers from the kind of the fallacy of certainty and that is one of the things that we've learned uh, 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 about about funding is that so much of it is predicated on the fallacy of certainty. You know, a funder has a world view that um, uh, in in which there are a number of assumptions about uh, about need and about effectiveness, and we as applicants buy into that, and so we offer a set of goods and products and services that are going to meet those outcomes. We know that those are subject to multiple variables outside of our control. And yet we all play that game. Well, the, the lid has been lifted on that. And it would be perverse to go back to that. So I think that, you know, one of the drums we've got to beat very loudly now, and we've been beating this for 20 years at Ivar, is that unrestricted funding should be the default position for everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think from all of your reports, Ben, I think um, that's my favourite term, that line, um, the, the fallacy of certainty. Um, it's <laughs> so true um, for, for grant makers looking for that kind of certainty in, in what they fund always succeed in. Um, we, we've got some more questions coming through, and I, I mean, a number of these are kind of um, broad questions in relation to grant making rather than necessarily specific to um, your presentation. So I'm just going to unmute Emma and Kirsten as well. So um, I'll kind of ask these questions to, to all three of you really. Um, and and any, anyone can kind of jump in and answer. Um, and, and we'll just do a bit of kind of general Q&A now and then we can do some more at the end as well. Um, so um, we've got one on, um, thank you for a great presentation. I'm interested in hearing more around how funders can better reach small BAME groups, um, which is obviously something that's been kind of looked at by a number of the kind of um, funders giving out emergency grants. So, um, yeah. um, I, I, I can go for that one if you, if you like. Um, so actually, I think the, the work that's been done by Charity So White has been um, excellent. Um, if you haven't already had a look at their website, it's full of um, amazing resources and also 
um, a pledge that a lot of people signed up to, um, which did actually include um, a, com a commitment by funders to allocate 20% of their funding to um, BAME-led organisations. And their recommendation was to go through um, um, infrastructure organisations that are um, linked to the BAME community to do that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one, one way of doing it. Um, but I think it's a really, really good question. And I think it's definitely around how funders actually are setting up their processes and whether that is a barrier. Um, and I think it's proven to be a barrier. Um, and also the question about, um, you know, doing a trust-based approach, does that actually lock out some um, groups that, that haven't already built those relationships? If I can just um, add as well to Kirsten, just a couple of useful resources. Um, Grantcraft have a really good um, resource on sort of using a racial justice lens when grant making and that sort of says that you look at everything so it's kind of how do you look at your criteria how do you look at your outreach strategy how do you look at the whole thing so that's really useful and the other one is peak grant making also have good resources on on a kind of how to guide of how to do it so if you look at some of them um, America is just a little bit ahead of the game really um, so if you look at those American resources they're quite helpful Cool, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions which are um, asking about um, the fact that there's a lot of funders have really focused on charities that are already known to them um, and, and supporting their existing grantees. Um, so, how, you know, in, in those cases, how do you start a dialogue with those funders? Um, I think that was... Uh, yeah, how do you start dialogue with those funders was one of them and the, and the other person was asking, um, you know, how do we, given that that's a positive for those small number of charities, but not for all the others who are not yet receiving funding from, how, how do we make sure that the trust sector doesn't stagnate? I think it's a very tricky one, this. I mean, I, and I, I think we, we, you know, we need to acknowledge that it's complicated. It's not, there isn't a simple answer to this, because I think there was a very plausible explanation as to why some foundations who themselves remember were, you know, were facing all of the stresses and uncertainties that we were all having about, you know, uh, about lockdown, about schools, about elderly relatives and so on, you know, that that, that we, we, we were all in it together in that regard in terms of the human experience of this and I think that there were choices to be made and you know foundation funding isn't fair it is a series of judgments and choices about selecting organizations who align with the foundation's objectives and mission and there is a kind of limited pot of money to go around so judgments have to be made and some judgments were that you know, it was it was better in the immediate term to try and uh, protect, understood as kind of strengthen and secure organisations about whom a judgment had already been made in terms of alignment with the foundation's criteria, etc. Um, rather than trying to trying to proliferate that kind of funding portfolio at that moment, and I think you know, I think that was a reasonable case. Uh, to be made. The challenge is, is sort of when and how to pivot. Um, and I do think that there is a risk that, and, and I think this links to the conversation that we were just having about um, access for, you know, BAME organisations and particularly smaller groups. The risk is a sort of, you know, a rhetorical shift to just being more open to more organisations. But that won't achieve anything. I mean, it really will not achieve anything because actually the eligible, you know, unless you actually dive into the detail of process, you will not open up access because people will be thwarted by eligibility criteria, for example, to pick, you know, example, the Emma kids. So I think, you know, one of the things we're hoping to do with the learning review, and I think eligibility criteria is probably one of the things we will focus on is how can you really construct that in the image of the groups and organizations that you're trying to support. So actually your process looks like something 
that they can relate to, that they can align with, that they can fit with. That, that you know, if we go back to the Grenfell experience and the Westway Community Centre, that's what happened there. Because that was just about people coming to talk about the work they did. And the foundation needed to put that into a system. So they took the responsibility to put that onto paper. And you can, if you, I will send the link round, but Tudor ran a brief pilot in Hartlepool of reaching out to very small groups, face-to-face -face, trustees, grant staff, organizations, one afternoon in a, in a, in a kind of, in a reception room in, in a hotel in Hartlepool and a hundred thousand pounds given out that evening. In, in a very, very different model, but that was very intentional. It was very planned. It was carefully curated. You can't just do this by signing a pledge. That won't achieve anything, I'm afraid. I think if I can just come in, thanks Ben. Um, I think there's sort of, there are obviously different funders. So some grant makers will have that, you know, never darken our door. We never want to hear from you. Um, we only fund those that we're already funding and some of those it's probably not worth bothering and spending your time and effort trying to jump in front of that are kind of quite traditional and maybe not going to change but there are some progressive funders who have very strategically and deliberately and intentionally chosen to manage demand by kind of narrowing their strategic focus and therefore there will only be pe certain people that will fit and um, they're trying to manage that wasted effort on both sides of kind of having an open program when actually the reality is they're only going to fund certain specific niche things. In that instance, if you genuinely do fit with them and they are closed, the best thing you can do is be absolutely brilliant at what you're doing and then be visible in the sense that you're kind of going, hello, we're over here, we want you to look at us too. And that's, you know, a tricky thing to do, but certainly can be done. So it's just about, I guess, what Ben was saying earlier about being solid on your mission and being really good at what you're doing. And then there's an element that I'm afraid it's still a little bit of hope and luck that you'll be noticed, but that's probably your best chance. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, from from the perspective of a fundraiser as well, I think um, absolutely for your organisation to be doing great work in, in the field um, and to be that little bit proactive in terms of contacting the funder and, and, you know, I suppose, given that the majority of funders that take that type of approach are taking, you know, they, they therefore do have a strategic approach to their funding and so that, you know, if they're funding in a niche area, they're likely to want to learn more about what's happening in that area and the kind of latest insights. So if you are um, gathering learning and producing evaluation and so on, then or holding events and things, you know, it's probably worth inviting them to events often to share some of that learning and that sort of thing. And, you know, if, if, they, if they don't want to engage, then they won't, but it, 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 you know, sometimes you need to be proactive about that sort of thing. Um, we're getting quite a lot of good questions in, I think, and some interesting comments. Um, I think we'll do one more now, um, and then we'll um, get back into, we'll get Emma and Kirsten to do their presentation, so we'll make sure we've got enough time for those, and then another 15 minutes of Q&A at the end where we can pick up the other questions have already been posted and if people just keep on posting stuff as, as it comes to them um, we'll pick up as many as we can at the end. Um, so the the one that we'll do now is um, pretty much all the funding is geared towards Covid related and emergency funding. Um, so this came from someone, um, a charity that funds research into healthy ageing and all that sort of funding seems to have dropped off. Um, so the question is, how can we position ourselves um, to, to procure funding right now? Which I thought was, was a good, interesting question, but it seems to have stumped <laughs> everyone for the moment. Um, I think, you know, it's, I mean, my view, because obviously I've been working on that side of things, is definitely that during that kind of emergency funding kind of time, which I think we've kind of come through now, um, if, if you weren't working, you know, in, in direct relation to the situation caused by COVID, then it, it was much harder 
um, to source funding. Um, and there were some that were about um, helping charities to survive. Um, but, but generally speaking, if your work is completely unrelated, then that, that did make it very challenging at that time. Um, I think, you know, now we're moving beyond that. I think the, uh, one of the reasons there's been so much interest in this session, I think, is that there is so much uncertainty still about what happens next. Um, I think this month, the next kind of, this month and next month will be when we, we learn a lot more um, I think one of the key things, I mean, I, you know, my best guess is that we can forget about any more government funding. Um, I think, you know, looking at the National Lottery funders and particularly National Lottery Community Fund, I think, you know, they clearly stated six months ago that they were allocating all of their funding towards COVID response for six months. So they now need to make a statement of what they're doing next. Um, and I think once we get that, uh, some of the big trusts and foundations, if they've not already made it clear what they're doing, they will then kind of follow suit saying um, what their direction is going to be. Um, and, and we'll start to get a bit of a clearer picture of how, how things look. Um, and, and so in terms of that kind of how we position ourselves, I think it's it's a interesting wording of the question because I think it is about positioning yourselves and, you know, articulating to funders um, you know, this is why our particular organisation is in need of funding, you know, why we're uniquely placed to make this particular difference that, that we're in need of. Um, so then that positioning part of your proposals becomes really key. Um, I think Kirsten and Ben, you both had something to say, should we go to Kirsten first and then to Ben? Yeah, um, I think that um, it is unpredictable, but I think especially smaller foundations are probably, they may have been impacted in terms of their endowment taking a knock, which might have less, uh, led to them make, potentially making a reduction um, in their grant spend. And I think that is going to have to, in a way, kind of focus the mind a little bit. Um, so you may see um, funders maybe kind of taking a pause and then coming out again with a plan potentially, but I don't think that I can't see that, that happening like now, um, it might be over the next few months and maybe in the new year. Um, and I can talk a little bit about what we're doing on that front a bit later, maybe. Great. Um, ben, did you have something to share on that point as well? Just a, an observation, I think, that, we, that we've that we made recently, which is that the idea that perhaps we, we all held previously that there was something called an emergency and then that we would move into something called recovery and renewal, I don't think is accurate and I'm not sure it's helpful. Um, I think, you know, we, I don't want to get into definitions of what an emergency is, but I mean, I think we are, you know, we all appear to be accepting a degree of unpredictability and uncertainty and complexity for the foreseeable future. And I mean, I'm just repeating a point I made earlier that in the sense that that if that is the new normal, then that needs to be reflected in how foundations themselves articulate the plans. I don't think that that has to equate to six month funding, because actually I think it, it, it and we've argued that we need to move to longer term funding for both sides because it creates too much stress in the system. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, the, one of the pledges that we're making as an organization as an infrastructure organization is to try and uh, you know do what we can to encourage that mindset um uh and to be and for, for foundations to be to you know to show their workings this is what we know now this is what we can commit to now um the age of the five-year plan uh, is for now over, I think, and 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 as applicants, we need in a sense to develop a slightly different narrative, as I was saying earlier, that is really grounded in the you know, mission, purpose, the public benefit we're bringing, the value that our services activities bring, without which people's lives would, um, you know, um, be inferior and uh, would be diminished. Um, I think that's really important, articulating the value that we bring. 
Great, thank you, Ben. And I, I know you're you're going to have to shoot off in a moment, so thank you very much for your time Not today. Sure, um, your, sorry to miss your presentations. presentations. I'll okay. stay. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and indeed for all, all the work that you're doing that you've been able to draw on and reference today. Um, okay, so um, I think next we'll have um, Emma, if you can if you can talk to us and share your insights, and then okay. we'll do Kirsten immediately afterwards, and then we'll go back and do some more Q&A. Okay, um, I do have slides to share, so I'm going to try, and if someone could reassure me that they can see them, <laughs> then we'll go from there. Oh, I'm disabled from screen sharing. Um, I will somehow enable that. Well, everyone can okay. get a pause and breath. <laughs> um, I think you should be able to now. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Great, that's working. Is that working? Yeah. Lovely. So, after Ben, it's always tricky going second because he's certainly covered some things, but hopefully there's no harm in hearing some of them again and knowing that, yes, they're definitely kind of what's happening in, in terms of changes. So these are my reflections for you. I wanted to start off with some positives. So um, grant makers have responded to COVID in lots of positive ways. So one of them quite obviously is giving more money so this data comes from 360s um 360 giving covid tracker so in some cases that was giving more money to existing grantees so you saw examples like esme fairbairn um giving extra money to lots of their grantees and then there were all the new programs so whether that was cloth workers on capital or arts council on artists i mean you would have all have seen or tried to keep track of all the lists of new money They've responded quickly, so the decision making process has been sped up. And from my experience of assessing emergency funds um, during the last few months, there was a different attitude to risk um, streamlining of due diligence to get the money out quickly. Um, funders were more flexible around deadlines, around how funding can be used, that shift to unrestricted as well as reporting. More collaboration. So funders coming together to pool resources, whether that was National Emergencies Trust or, or London Community Response and, and other examples, and also getting involved in advocacy. So as Alex mentioned, you know, over 400 um, signing up to the Together We Stand with the Sector Pledge, um, examples of calling for government funding and get involved in that, and also specific appeals. So things like um, addressing the attainment gap. It wasn't all rosy. Um, there was also some really disappointing and poor practice. So some funding just paused, um, some offers pulled that were sort of commitments that were withdrawn. Programs closed early in that horrible first come first served um, approach. And fundraisers, as I'm sure you'll know, just having to fill in endless surveys about how you've been affected and what you need. Um, the changes in practice didn't take place in isolation, but in a context of a number of trends in grant making and discussions that have been going on about shifts in power dynamics, more emphasis on trust, less on metrics, um, increased collaboration, and then the sort of total asset approach where you look at your investments in line with your mission. I'm not going to cover all that today, but Alex said he put a a link to this short film I made that covers some of that kind of pre-COVID, um, during COVID and kind of post-COVID, though I'm not sure we're there yet, so he'll share that with you. But what is really interesting is that a lot of these changes heralded are just nothing new. Um, like Ben, I've worked in the sector for a long time and charities have always wanted unrestricted core funding, 
simplified application processes, better reporting processes, a shift in power from that kind of voiceless fund seeker to a valued partner having a relationship with, with funders. And if you take a look at this example, this is a grant seeker's bill of rights. It comes from um, Joel Oroz, who's professor of philanthropic studies at Johnson Center for Philanthropy. And he drew this up in 2010. There, there are other earlier examples as well, but I was like this one. Um, and this will be really familiar and things like the right to have all proposals read um, and the right to um, be paid for the work that you do in terms of monitoring reports and the time that you spend. So the practice committed to by grant makers signing up to the We Stand With The Sector pledge is not that radical. It was things like listening and being flexible. Um, a lot of the changes that are always being asked for are actually really small. So I know the fundraising chat Facebook group, they were asking for funders to be clear about when it's word count or character count and asking for um, the, if you've got an online application to make all the questions available so you don't just see them when you're already in the form. And, and Ivar's report on reporting good practice um, which is great, says things like um, funders only ask for documents they're going to read and use. I mean, you know, really, we're still kind of there. Um, so the question for me is therefore, why haven't the changes happened before? And grant makers can operate outside good practice and be slow to respond and slow to change because they can. They lack external accountability. They're generally not representative of the communities they serve. Um, this example is from IDR Online. They've got a lovely series of grant proposal answers if, if you were brutally honest, and I, I suggest you look at them. But they don't necessarily have experience on being on the other side. So they don't necessarily know about running services or seeking funds, and they hold the power in the relationship. So they can make fund seekers jump through hoops, they can do things that most charities can't, so they can close whilst they review their strategy. And, and obviously the people working in grant making are generally really good people trying to do the right thing. Um, but if they get really high volumes of applications anyway, if no one's honest because they don't want to be for fear of affecting the, their chances of getting funding, and if they don't get out to meet and listen to people on the ground, then where is the driver for change going to come from? So the urgency of COVID-19 was a powerful catalyst for change, as was the need to be seen to be doing the right thing in response. So leaders of trusts and foundations can also be quite competitive. And there is a kind of peer to peer mechanism for being the ones being pioneering and the ones listening the best or responding the quickest. And at the moment, there's a lot of kudos in showing how flexible you can be, how good you are at, at listening. And previously, there was a lot of kind of scramble around saying how good you were at, at core funding. These things have kind of fashions. Um, but what, given the absence of accountability, is going to make the current good changes stick? So outside of the kind of individual and sometimes ego-driven mechanisms, there are various drivers that are looking to increase the accountability of grant makers and to challenge that power imbalance between fund holders and fund seekers. So for example, um, there's a driver for trust foundation boards and staffing to be more diverse and more reflective of communities served. So 10 years time 2027 initiative is just one example, which is about increasing the number of people from working class backgrounds into decision making roles in foundations. There's moves for greater transparency. So Grant Advisor have just finished their UK pilot, which is where um, applicants can rate the, their experience of applying to different funders. And then you've got 360 giving where funders are open about what they fund. There are some really good examples of, of good practice, good guidance. So um, ACF have just done their Stronger Foundation series that's got really good stuff in there. And there are some internal voices. So Grant Givers Movement is one of them that Kirsten will talk about. 
and external voices such as Ivar's role as a kind of critical friend, Charity So White, um, there's, there's all sorts of different voices who are applying kind of challenge and scrutiny. And there are whole movements about shifting power to those affected by decisions. So you've got the whole sort of participatory and trust-based approaches to grant making becoming more significant. I guess my worry is that it's not necessarily going to be enough. So those trends, the shifting to kind of relational, trust-based, less metric-obsessed giving has been there for, for many years and change seems painfully slow at times. And there's a risk that the changes in practice in response to COVID may also be sort of superficial and just might be lost when the next thing kind of comes along and gets everyone's attention. So what is next? I'm going to try and answer this question. Um, don't hold me to all of it, but I'll have a go. So for large grant makers, the focus is definitely shifting from that emergency response to the longer term. So you start to see phrases like rebuilding the future, supporting recovery and resilience in, in the new programmes. So things like EDGE have a post-COVID-19 revival fund, BBC Children in Needs was um, COVID-19 Next Steps grants programme. And I've also seen examples of pretty much every other response. So we've got new programmes coming in, responding to racial justice, responding to intersectionality. We've got grant makers continuing to spend more, so bringing forward spend down dates or like the Ford Foundation, again in America, who are borrowing because the interest rates are so low and so they're bringing in new money that way. There's a reopening of business as usual funds. So you get things like Comic Relief Change Makers Fund. You've still got pausing. You've still got reducing spending. It depends where people's money are coming from. So if it's on their investment income or their business profits that may be affected, or because they've already given out lots of money already. But kind of offsetting that, you've got new people motivated to give and you've got setting up of, of new funds still. So exactly which one of those is going to win out, I'm afraid I just don't know. Um, I suspect we're going to have a real mix for a while. And what I think this means for fundraisers is as has already been said, there's going to be a lot more uncertainty. So um, as ever, anchor yourself to focusing on your core purpose and don't kind of chase the money and get distracted by whatever's going on. I know it's hard, but that's absolutely core cool, is focus on the mission. Do look out for the new funds. There'll be those around kind of recovery or however they're phrased, but they'll going to be more around systemic and structural change, looking at root causes, looking at prevention. There's going to be more on intersectionality and there's going to be more on digital as well. Um, be ready for questions about diversity, equity and inclusion and how representative you are of those you serve. Um, although we've talked about kind of streamlining processes, that's going to get added in. I suspect to all applications and you're going to be asked for your DEI strategy documents. So I think they're going to be added um, be ready for questions about your forward planning for both delivery and finances. However unfair that is, I think you're going to be asked for what your thinking is as things change um, be ready for proactive funders. As we've already talked about, as demand goes up, um, strategic focus always narrows to manage and you're going to have more people that are going to be proactively looking um, for those they want to support and assert your influence whenever you can. So trust is a two way street and I know funders that have offered core funding and nobody applied for it because they didn't believe and didn't trust that the funder actually meant it. So they just played it safe and asked for project funding anyway. Um, if grant makers are asking for feedback and are saying they will listen, then be brave and tell them what you really think. Um, and finally, just celebrate any examples of good practice. It does help um, encouraging positive change and that peer kind of this funder was much better than you sort of it sounds very childish, but you know what I mean, um, does actually really work. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to look forward to if we have any time for more questions. 
right? Thanks, Emma. Um, that was great. Okay, screens back. Um, yeah, that was really interesting, and I love the little Lego characters in your slides as well. Um, I'm sure people will have questions on some of the things you've covered. Um, Amy is keeping track of them all, so we'll um, we'll go straight to Kirsten next, um, and then we'll pick up questions um, at the end again. Um, okay, Kirsten, do you want to unmute and um, I'll hand over to you? Um, thanks, Emma. That was incredible. I don't know how I'm going to follow both you and Ben <laughs> and what I can add to it. So I think I'm just going to kind of give a, a brief rundown of uh, the, the two kind of points of view that I'm coming from. So one is um, as head of charitable partnerships and strategy at the Goldsmiths Company, which is a livery company in the city of London that has been around for 700 years. Um, so just, you know, pretty fresh and new. Um, and uh, that's, I've been there for eight years, um, kind of overseeing, starting as charity administrator and building up to head of charitable partnerships and strategy. So kind of um, having a lot of input into, into the kind of um, reviews that we've made over the years and the partnerships that we're kind of trying to build and, and, and where we're really trying to get to because there's a lot of work to be done um, on that. And also um, I can speak a little bit about our experience during COVID-19. Um, we had two, two kind of um, uh, streams of funding, uh, essentially trade, which is um, supporting our trades of goldsmithing, silversmithing, and our wider charitable giving, which is uh, in the areas of youth, criminal justice, um, education, and older people. Um, and then the other hat that I wear is, um, as, as Alex said, um, co-founder of the Grant Givers Movement, uh, which we started up about two years ago. Um, in response to a kind of gap that we saw that was uh, the voice of people working within grant making not really being heard and when actually there was quite a lot of discussions in the background between people working in grant making that were really seeing the issues from the inside um, and trying to kind of push for progressive change using our platform a collective kind of uh, platform to um, to drive that um, so change from within essentially um, so if I go back to um, our response to COVID, um, we actually really kind of went full circle in terms of um, going back to our original purpose, which is quite an interesting one having such a long history. So um, by that, I mean that we went back to supporting people within the trade of gold and silversmithing, individuals. So going to, from, from granting to charities to changing to granting to individuals, which was one, which was one big shift um, in terms of type of grant making, doing incredibly fast um, response. So um, we worked across the organization to set up um, funding to individuals. Over three weeks, we gave out £750,000 to 475 people. Uh, that was a massive shift for us. Um, we had never worked that quickly before. Um, and also it, as Emma mentioned, it really meant that the trustees had to accept the risk that was involved in that, in, in, in that fast paced uh, giving and also the delegation that they kind of, you know, they uh, allowed the grant staff to kind of to take on. So that was really positive. And going forward, you know, we're not going to um, kind of forget our wider giving, but when we are now thinking about how do we how do we almost kind of like align um, those two pretty separate parts of our giving, you know, the kind of giving to the trade of goldsmithing, silversmithing, and people working within that apprenticeships, bursaries, all of that kind of stuff, and the wider work that we that we have been doing over the past kind of you know five to ten years around criminal justice, youth um, education. Um, so yeah, that's that's been quite a big shift. In terms of um, the Grant Givers Movement, what I'll touch on is um, a report that we put out just uh, actually, well, in the midst of COVID, um, but that we had been working on um, from the end of last year. And that was a survey of um, grant making staff, essentially, with some trustees and some sector leaders as well, inputting. Uh, into that and it was all around the question of you know their experiences of power and trust within grant making um, from the point of view of, of people working within that sector so we had 142 responses to that so really quite a good response rate um, some some real kind of admissions in a way you know an acceptance of 
um, the power that grant staff actually hold um, to influence, so not necessarily kind of very, um, you know, typical power in, in the form of a trustee role, but actually the influence that they have around um, shaping where grants might end up. Um, so I think that's a really kind of strong point actually going forward, um, you know, potentially with grant givers movement being an ally to um, people working on, in the, on the fundraising side or the, um, you know, being sector leader, you know, as, as I mentioned, kind of asserting your influence, um, I think will be a really, I, re I really hope that that carries on, you know, um, into the future, because I think that if there's a risk that it will go back to everyone kind of um, clambering for funds and therefore not actually stepping up and challenging what grant makers are doing. Um, so I think that um, potentially the power of grant covers movement is to is to hold up and to support people working on the fundraising side and um, to use their voice as well and, and to make that more of a collaborative kind of approach. So the kind of key findings that we found from our survey were that there was a really overwhelming consensus that power imbalance exists, which isn't surprising really to anyone. And that was between you know, funders and grantee partners. Um, over 90% agreed that power should be rebalanced and almost 80% agreed that better redistribution of power would lead to more impactful grant making. So funders said that they were taking steps to rebalance power and I think Emma highlighted that as well. You know, um, just over 50% agreed that their organisations were moving towards kind of um, a better redistribution of power. Uh, they, they gave examples of, of what, what was happening to address that and I think quite a lot of that points to what again what Emma said which is really simple basic things you know like being able to have a conversation and um, you know being clear about your priorities and um, you know uh, arranging things on on grantees terms as opposed to kind of them um, always coming to, to you and having to you know dance to, to your tune and um, so yeah I think that was uh, yeah kind of you know not not necessarily really um really crazy stuff <laughs> to, to hear um so some of the stuff that inhibited trust um was that respondents to the survey cited issues such as funders creating a kind of race at the bottom in terms of low pay in the sector applying punitive measures when things don't go according to plan um grant grantee partners and uh, not wanting to bite the hand that feeds them and um, which i kind of touched upon just, just there and a lack of lived thematic or even sector experience on boards, uh, which leads to misunderstanding and trust and one directional learning. So I think um, all of this kind of is, is very relevant in terms of where we want to get to um, now, you know, going forward. I mean, we did this obviously prior to, to the uh, pandemic, but I think the practice that we're talking about, uh, we, want, we want to push that as just, standard practice it's not like it's not even good practice it's just how you should be as a funder um, and I think that um, yeah hopefully that will carry forward and I just made a couple of notes about some of the questions um, that were in um, in the the kind of um, summary of, of this event uh, in terms of changes you know going forward and I think that you know so for example one of the one of the questions was um, Let's see. Yeah, so the, the, the idea that, you know, a lot of um, funders have been more flexible in responses. Um, and do we think that people are more open to core funding stuff like that? I think that's, you know, proven that a lot of funders um, are open to that and will be going forward. I hope, I just, I just hope that that will carry forward. And I also think it's, it, it depends on how, how foundations actually responded um, to the, to the crisis you know did they actually come out of the comfort zone did they go into a collaborative kind of approach you know through L, um, the london community response fund and therefore are they going to think actually this is this is a different way of working so we're going to carry this forward if they paused or they really thought right we've had a knock we can't do anything then obviously there's a risk that they won't see a need to change and again it comes back to accountability there is a huge lack of accountability to the communities that we're supposed to exist to serve uh, within foundations. And I think um, banging that drum louder and louder is going to be absolutely necessary for that to change. Um, so I'm not sure if I've kind of, you know, covered everything that 
that I'd hoped or whether that was useful, but I'm happy to answer any questions or just kind of leave it there, I think. <laughs> great. Thanks, Callistan. That was that was great. Um, so we're yeah, we're going to um, take some questions now. Um, I just sent some for I've just seen one that's quite interesting actually, so I'm going to just jump off with that one. Um, uh, so someone was saying, you know, a lot a lot of these conversations are happening, and these kind of positive changes are happening in the biggest foundations, those that have actually got staff working for them, and so on, and and we know these kind of usual suspects, um, and some of them were already um, doing this kind of stuff, you know, talk about Tudor Trust and people like that. Um, but, you know, the vast majority of grant making trusts are actually the smaller um, trusts and foundations with no staff, um, just trustees. Do you think that these sorts of changes will filter out to that kind of wider sector or is it just going to be the kind of top 30 or so? Um, I think I Again, it's really unhelpful because I have such a range because it kind of depends. I think there are some really small trusts that you'll all know that are kind of sitting in a trustee's solicitor's office um, and they, you know, don't spend a lot of time for about what they're doing. And there's not a lot of kind of deep engagement with the sector. They're putting out lots of, you know, 250, 500 pound, 1000 pound grants to loads of speculative applications. There are some small trusts that I work with who maybe are more sort of family foundations that are deeply engaged and thought, thoughtful about it and aware of it, especially those that are involving the next generation in their giving, where there's a lot of talk about the kind of privilege of wealth and what you then do with it. And so they have, you know, I have some very deep conversations with some small foundations as well. So really hard to know how far the ripple is going to go. The noise, as you're right, is in the top big, large funders that are putting out reports and have got the kind of resources behind them. But I definitely think it is affecting decision making in a lot of, there's a lot of sort of more progressive, smaller ones. And then there's a bunch that I don't think are going to change ever. Yeah, um, I would definitely say that this is this has been a question for a very long time. You know, it's kind of pointed to the progressive funders and kind of like, is is that just gonna, is it just gonna always be them? You know, that this like select group, which is a really small, well, really small in comparison to the kind of ten thousand foundations that actually exist in the UK. Um, and I think with the grant givers movement, particularly, what we're trying to do is reach out to people that are actually potentially that one staff member you know, in, in a small foundation. And um, so so perhaps, you know, they can actually make these these like little changes that actually make a big difference in terms of how you relate to grantees and how your processes can change. And speaking as a, you know, as somebody who's, who's working with a very limited um, staff, it's just me and one, one other person essentially, um, with a budget of about, you know, between, you know, kind of two to three million pounds a year. Um, you know, I think that that is a classic um, kind of issue in, in a way, um, you know, in, in the foundation sector, it's kind of, um, there's generally very, very small staff teams, often just trustees. Um, but as, as Emma said, I think that as this becomes just the norm, perhaps, you know, things will actually change. I think that's why it shouldn't, you know, think these changes shouldn't be seen as, as good practice. It should be just what you do. And perhaps that will actually this this pandemic might you know just spur people on to to do to do that. I think it's an opportunity in a way, you know. I think it's quite um, interesting if you think of sort of metrics and, and measuring outcomes of impact as an example. So obviously that kind of came in, and that was everybody you know all grant makers wanting you to measure impact and evidence and everything. And I think it is tipping back a little bit more with trust to be less kind of metrics driven and certainly that's harder with core and unrestricted funding so there is a swing so if some days when I'm in a Twitter echo bubble I feel very positive that we're all heading towards trust-based philanthropic approaches 
But actually, if you look at the kind of ESG world and the more business world, it is deeply wedded to science and evidence and research and metrics and demonstrating your impact. So it kind of depends who the decision makers, what messages they're hearing and where they're exposed. So some of the more business minded kind of trustees may be hearing a lot of that metrics measure science evidence conversation whereas i feel like i'm hearing trust and participation more and i'm not quite sure who who wins out in that in that split or whether the two just carry on alongside yeah and i, th I think that's been a classic kind of um issue around trustee boards and and the, the expertise that is valued um and maybe you know I think it has to come from from there in a way for you know tr trust and foundations to recognize that there are very different types of expertise that should be valued on a par with the kind of the, the ones who've come from business and stuff like that so that needs to change i think as well um uh, next question we've got um is probably the one that comes up the most um in the conversations i'm having with fundraisers and charity leaders at the moment um which is about really, I suppose, whether funding is going to reduce next year. Um, so it was, what do you think the impact of funders awarding more funding in 2020-21 will be on 2021-22? Um, <laughs> Looking at you, Kirsten. <laughs> yeah, sure, great. Um, so I, I think, again, it is a mixed bag, really it is. And actually that's not a bad thing, probably. And um, because if everyone suddenly went to one way of working, then it would really close out a lot of, a lot of um, charities from applying to things. But I really think it depends. Um, you know, you've got some, some perhaps, you know, more traditional foundations that might have, you know, um, actually increased their spend, given out money and kind of thought, right, that's it. You know, we're just going to, we're going to batten down the hatches now. And actually we've given loads of money, so we're going to just stop doing things. But I think that's, that's, that's not a responsible approach and I think the ones who have um, increased the funding that are the, the more progressive ones and the bigger ones will be thinking about next year you know they would have they would have thought of that when they, when they were setting up these emergency funds and and many of them especially if they're endowed will have um, taken that into account um, in terms of you know okay we're gonna we're gonna increase spending but we know that things you know worse is to come in a way and actually from Goldsmith's point of view um, it's been a really tricky one. Um, I, I was in favour, you know, of of increasing our grant making, and that hasn't happened. Um, and the view, actually, of of the trustees, I guess, was that they're looking to the longer term. You know, um, next year people are still going to need funding. The year after that, people are still going to need funding. You know, we need to kind of be careful and and again that's about that's about the risk question which I think somebody has, has asked about in the, in the questions um in the chat um it is about appetite for risk as well you know I think there's there's a huge question um especially on, on the U.S. side about what is philanthropy for if it isn't for spending now you know in a crisis you know the rainy day is now so foundations should be spending but you're not going to get everyone doing that and I don't think that's a bad thing and I think it's quite a positive thing, I think, is that um, people are just talking about grants and donations and giving out money. Whereas if you think back a little bit, it was kind of social investment and, you know, are there other better models and kind of impact investing was kind of much more exciting and grants were kind of boring. And I think grants have really proved themselves in this um, in, in its emergency, you know, grant funding is quick and agile and you can get it out quickly. So nobody's been talking about a tender process for COVID recovery. It, and I think that's a positive. So I think if I'm biased, but if we can therefore keep more money in kind of grant funding and less of it getting kind of moved over into social finance, then I think that's a positive and that might keep more money in the sector. Well, um, I, I'm mindful of time. I don't think we're going to get through all of the questions. So um, if people do have burning questions they've got that don't get answered in the session, um, feel free to pop us through an email. Um, and I know Emma and Kirsten are both on LinkedIn and Twitter as well, um, as we are. Um, 
I know Ben's not, but Ivar, we've got an account, so um, you know you can you can use social media to get get some questions out there if we don't get to everything. Um, yeah, being able to keep track of all the questions. So sorry if I've missed anything specific. Yeah. No. I know the one about do funders look at websites? Yes, yes, yes. We look at everything, especially proactive ones. Oh, yeah. Look at the charity commission record. You have everything. Look at it all. So assume that we're looking. Yeah, again, they're, they're all different, aren't they? So some will and some won't, and some will do different levels of due diligence. But generally, I think uh, these days, I think most people at least have a quick look at the website, certainly if they're looking at kind of making bigger grants. Um, there's a question, I don't know if either of you guys are aware of any evaluations that are going to be done on the kind of BAME uh, funding schemes that have been launched recently. Where are any evaluations? Um, not necessarily, sorry, on the schemes that have been launched, but I know that the funders for race equality are um, pushing for lots of foundations to do a race equality audit of their grants. And I think that that will be coming out towards the kind of end of the year. I'm just making things up, but <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully. And I think uh, that will definitely lead to questions about it. Because I think it's an accepted, it's kind of accepted that there's not enough um, funding going to BAME groups. Um, but I think having that, um, research will help you know the argument for why is that and what needs to change so, yeah, yeah. Um, there was an interesting point I saw um, as a comment in the chat about being careful that a move to more trust-based philanthropy if it does come doesn't um, kind of worsen that um, you know in inequality inequity um, you know and I suppose you know the, the challenge with that um, is that people give to the people they know already so you don't get that increased diversity. Um, I think, I think, I think, I think yeah, sorry, well. we'll say a lot about trust, sorry, because I think no, no, no. trust-based philanthropy is used to describe an awful lot of things as well. So you could argue that it does include people that you don't know, but actually you some in other circumstances, actually you do all the due diligence, you do all that bit first and you outreach and you contact people and you fund them and then you kind of go, well, trust you to get on with it now. So it, it, it can vary hugely what people are, are meaning by the different approaches. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I absolutely agree. I think that is a huge risk. And it was actually, it was a bit of a criticism, I think, and there, when, when, when funds started coming out that potentially they were going to groups that were already known um, and there is that kind of referral thing as well, you know, which actually probably um, I think there is a risk that it, it will it would exclude um, groups that aren't already known. Um, and I think funders are absolutely going to have to take that into account um, going forward. So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, OK, what else? Um, I was going to ask. Um, oh yes, this is an interesting one about um, when funders have set kind of specific um, kind of themes and areas that they're looking to fund and then in a funding round there's a kind of a particular um, area that ends up not being kind of funded. Um, should the charities from that kind of that group, that niche area, um, kind of come together and produce a bit of a kind of advocacy piece on you know what on the needs of that group and kind of you know making their case why that that kind of issue needs to be funded or does it just look a bit like sour grapes um i guess it's I mean, going i'd always say that yes you should if you think that um a funding strategy hasn't been implemented when it should have been I guess it's how you present it, isn't it? It's like, we've got some learning that is helpful to you. Can we share this? Can we talk to you? Can we help you? Um, it's, you know, I think would be welcome. It would be a good thing to do, but I, there is a risk, isn't there, that you, you're seen as being negative. And I, and I completely understand why people are fearful of doing that when there's so much riding on it, but I would go for it always, but. Yeah. I would as well. Safe. Oh, yeah. yeah, I definitely, I mean, it's, and it's probably easy to say from a funder's point of view, yeah. you know, I recognise the power that lies in that. Um, but, but yeah, I think if you have a good case, then, then absolutely. And I'm not sure, is that, is that if they've applied for something and then something, you know, another part of the work has been funded or, 
I think, yeah, I mean, the, the question looks like it was um, the type of funding programme where uh, there's obviously visibility about what has been funded at the, oh, at the okay. end of it, um, and that maybe there have been a few different areas that they wanted to fund, and one of them has been underrepresented, um, mm -hmm. whether the charities that were that applied under that aspect of the funding were unsuccessful. Um, I guess there's probably something there um, about kind of trying to open that conversation and maybe saying, you know, why were we all unsuccessful? And, you know, are you looking for something specific? Could we work in partnership and do some, you know, but, I mean, you know, sometimes funders will pay for some of that initial work around increased collaboration in a particular sector and bringing partners together. So there's probably something interesting um, there that you could put forward to try and kind of open that conversation and see where it might lead, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, we're down to the last kind of three minutes. So um, let me see if we've got some something that might be a quick response. <laughs> None of these are particularly quick response ones, but um, let's try this one. Do you think the idea of common application forms will gain any traction finally, um, as well as common evaluation, which I know I've campaigned on? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, Good. yeah. Yes, no. Well, I think, <laughs> I think the London Community Response um, has been a really good example of where it can work. Um, so I would, I would definitely hope so. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope it, I hope it does. I've certainly seen that, yeah, the London response has been sort of picked up and people are interested in that. Um, which would be good. I think it's tricky when you get a proliferation of different platforms all trying to do it and then you might not even solve the problem that we started with. But yeah, I live in hope. Yeah, I think there have been some attempts, haven't there, we're doing that. There's, there's been a, certainly at least one platform that's been set up to, and I don't think that, yeah, if it's too broad, I don't think it works. I think it's the London Community Response Fund seems to have worked really well from what I can see. You know, I don't know, you know, from the grant making side of things, how, how well it's worked for everyone, but it, it certainly seems like having that kind of one um, kind of point that you go through as an applicant and then for it to kind of get um, an initial sift and then going out to multiple funders and then them to kind of make the assessment award funding and, and start managing relationships seems to have worked really well um, so I think there's that's feels like you know there's a that's almost like a pilot that's gone well that other funders could look at doing whether it's by geography or whether it's by a particular kind of issue and funders could come together and, and work in that way and I think that would that would be of a benefit to the to both the charities applying and the, the funders looking to make a difference in in particular issues, I think it's always going to be really difficult, if not impossible, to do it for, you know, a really broad, you know, multi-issue kind of platform. But for specific issues or specific geographies, I think it could work really well. Um, right, we're dead on 11.30, so um, I'm going to just say another final thank you to the speakers. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined and given their time and, and asked questions and made comments as well. Um, as I said, we will email around uh, recording and links and what have you. Um, and and if, as I say, if you've got questions, post on social media or email. And, and again, we'll, we'll try and get some responses out to you. Um, great. So thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good bye. questions. Yeah, very good questions. <laughs> <laughs> I guess save the chat. Um.